Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, in our midst, actually for the first time, <laughs> that it's your first time in the US, right? Um, so we've been missing out on Elijah for a long time. Uh, he's been to other places and uh, he is visiting uh, our history department in the Modern South Asian Studies project for a month. Niladri is, when he's back home in Delhi, he's a professor at the, the Center for Historical Studies, professor of Modern South Asian History at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And um, most recently, he has been um, chairing and overseeing the writing of new Indian textbooks um, for high schools under the auspices of the NCRT, that's the government agency that funds the publication of these textbooks for government run, for schools that are funded by the central government. And these textbooks have been, have been at the center of controversy for a while because of the way that uh, the <coughs> earlier government, the Hindu government, um, the BJP government sort of said about rewriting them. And so Niladri and his colleagues have been re-rewriting them. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but this time not in the interest, from what I gather, uh, of any ideology in particular, but more in the interest of actually making school um, children more um, friendly towards debates and more open-minded about, about issues, uh, which uh, actually has meant that he, they've <laughs> raised the ire of not only people on the right, but also their old Marxist teachers who, who thought that such openness was going too far. Uh, they, they wanted the textbooks to be more directing of, of students. Um, Niladri has been a visiting professor at Johannesburg, Paris, and also held Agatha Harrison Fellowship at Oxford. Um, he has been, he's a co-editor of Studies in History, which is one of the preeminent history journals to come out of India. Um, he's also edited many prestigious series of publications, both from uh, Oxford University Press in Delhi and from Permanent Black. Uh, including um, tracks for the tri times in which I think the first one was co-authored by Sumit Sarkar and Tanika Sarkar. Khaki Shorts. On <coughs> Khaki Shorts, yeah, ab about which was a polemical tract by those historians about the BJP and their politics. Um, <coughs> Niladri's own book, The Great Agrarian Conquest, is forthcoming, coming out soon from Permanent Black. And he's working on another book called Consumption, Culture in the Market, Colonialism, in North in, in Northern India, and today he is talking um, to the ti speaking to the title Beyond the Code, Custom Law, and Colonialism. Welcome, Mr. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> this paper is uh, on custom law and colonialism, but uh, through the discussion of custom and law. I would like to reflect on four or five, three or four um, broader conceptual issues, <coughs> which I wish to outline at the beginning, and then see at the end how we can reflect on these issues. First uh, is the question, uh, is the notion of colonial power. Um, through a discussion of custom and law, I would like to think about uh, colonial power and uh, the way it has been conceptualized, perceived in recent years. Uh, if we look at the literature on colonial power in recent years, we find two opposing uh, views, um, uh, two contrary and opposing views um, predominant uh, in the literature. One is that colonial power was all powerful. It introduced laws, encoded social relationships, it enumerated and categorized people, classified people, uh, numbered people in some ways, calculated them, the census. Um, projects and a variety of ethnographic projects. It reshaped institutions, restructured the economy, reordered culture and values. Um, it's not just that it reordered the economy, which uh, even earlier historians talked about, but in recent years with uh, the post-colonial studies and all, we have seen how actually colonialism uh, reshapes the most, most intimate parts of ourselves. and. Uh, the inner selves of people is also reshaped by colonialism. <coughs> uh, second, there is a notion of colonial power which is contrary to this, which uh, in some way uh, looks at colonial power really as powerless, colonial state as powerless. Uh, it, 
it is resisted within society, it comes up against the barriers of embedded social institutions within society, and it cannot really overcome the, ins the, the pressures of local situations. Therefore, it is so constrained that it cannot really uh, mm, uh, shape, reshape work or govern the society in the way it would like to do in, in, in its, uh, through its own imaginary. So it's uh, a notion of a colonial power which is uh, acutely constrained, which is uh, severely constrained. So we have a notion which where colonial power is seen as uh, governing everything as well as a notion, an opposing one, where it's seen as uh, uh, lacking the power to govern. Uh, so through a discussion of custom and law, I'd like to see what we can say about these kinds of conceptions. Secondly, I'd like to see what a code really means. Uh, we are all talking about, in recent years, about encoding of things within society, about classification, categorization, uh, enumeration. We have a notion of an ethnographic state which actually catalogues people, conceives of people uh, in a variety of ways, uh, racial, uh, racial categorization, uh, numerical categorization, ethnographic categorization, etc. And we have codes being constantly, uh, uh, laws and customs and norms being constantly codified into unified, homogeneous, clearly stated, categorically stated, publicly pronounced uh, laws. And therefore, codification is seen as part of the colonial project uh, inspired by an Benthamite ideal, uh, inspired by a positivist utilitarian ideal, which seeks to make everything unambiguous, which seeks to make things clear, fixed, categorical. Now, this is uh, the transition very often from the uh, from a notion of a society where everything is unambiguous, everything is fluid, to a society where everything is categorical and fixed and certain, uh, and the code. In, cer in a certain sense, not just in colonial society, but everywhere uh, from the 19th century, uh, uh, the code is seen as an embodiment of that fixity and certainty. Uh, a code codifies and by its very nature specifies and categorically states. Um, but what is it, what does it really mean to codify and how does a code work? What does it mean within society? Does the code which is codified and made clear, m makes everything clear, really so certain of itself? Is it so fixed? Is it so uh, unambiguous? Now that's a question I would like to pose and therefore I call it beyond the code because I'm trying to suggest that code operates at one level, at the level of the state, at the level of intentions, at the level of will of the state. And therefore if we are trying to s look at the will of the state, we can see it in the code. But if you are looking at how it shapes society, what its relationships to the relationship is to the society, then we have to address the issue at a different level. We have to look for other kinds of evidence. We have to look for uh, uh, other kinds of material and um, uh, processes through which we can see whether the code really operates, whether the code really reshapes things, whether the code really codifies in the way that the state wills it, the, in the way the state wants to shape, govern, or categorize. So that's why I uh, frame it as beyond the code, because I think the code cannot really shape everything. Now, in a series of essays earlier, uh, papers, I had actually looked at the process of codification, and I had uh, looked at the ethnographic process through which um, you know, the, uh, the customs and norms in society in colonial India were actually inquired into, looked into, represented, uh, codified, and shaped. And how this process of ethnographic inquiry itself was a process of remaking of customs. Because while uh, the state wanted to preserve custom, but we know that in the very act of preservation, or all acts of preservation are also acts of transformation, because in the very act of knowing, uh, understanding, representing, things change. And I had looked at the processes of this change and how it changed and what it changes. But having said that, uh, one needs to go further. That is, even if it changes, 
And even if that becomes a code, if custom becomes code, and that's been seen for African society and other societies also, how during the colonial period customs and norms become new types of codes. But even if we accept that, that kind of a transformation, even then I think we don't have an adequate understanding of what it means to that society. So I'd like to push the argument one step further uh, to suggest that we need to look at what is going on in the ground. We need to move from the state to the villages. We need to look at what's happening at different, in different villages, in different places, in different locations, in actual concrete uh, situations of conflict, negotiation, conversation over laws, customs, norms. Therefore, from state, the will of the state, processes of codification at the top, we need to possibly look at conflicts at the bottom, in the villages themselves, in the fields and the uh, courtrooms. So a lot of my, uh, most of my material that I'll discuss and the stories that I'll tell uh, around which I'll build the argument is based on court cases in the villages uh, where uh, we see one type of a conflict going on which is a negotiation over the code, which is a negotiation of what law ought to be what custom is and what custom uh, should be or what law cannot be. Now, therefore, there is an everyday negotiation through which things happen. And that's why, again, it is beyond the code because the code comes under question. The code itself is not there fixed and certain of itself, nor are the officials or the lawyers who actually uh, uh, are there to implement the code they are not certain of what the code is, they are not certain of what the village norms are or what kind of a law should be implemented within the villages. So that's the second thing which I'll reflect in the process of the paper. The third is, uh, the, is a broader argument, uh, which is how does law capture the mind of the people? How does law, the language of law become part of the common sense? Uh, we know that before the British rule, law is not really part of the common sense of the people in the sense they don't think in terms of law always. There, are, uh, there is evidence from some regions that there are legal cases within the uh, villages, etc., even before the British rule in the 17th, late 16th, 17th, 18th century. But in general, uh, one could argue that it is in the colonial period that the language of law becomes the language of so, uh, society and conflict, uh, uh, society, and it is through law social relationships are negotiated, established, uh, and um, uh, transformed. That is, uh, relationships between people become relationship between categories, uh, cat between categories, legal categories at one level, established and mediated by law. Um, in fact, um, Barney Cohn, in one of his earliest essays on law, made the point that, um, uh, you know, unlike the West, where laws, uh, people go in for disputes to the courts in order to settle things, in India you have the reverse, that you go into the court actually to carry on a struggle and a conflict. Now, I would like to argue, uh, I would like to make a few points about that. Why is it that you go on, uh, you go to the court not to settle, uh, but to negotiate. Now, s the idea of settling, which Cohn, Bernie Cohn was operating with, with it was a notion of a Western law where certainty possibly is part of that legality. Uh, even that may be under question because if you look at the lower levels anywhere else, I think s uh, not the same, but similar processes will be at work. That is, there is a difference between state code and what operates on the ground. Uh, so I would argue that this process of conflict, everyday conflict that I'm talking about, this process of conflict which happens in the villages or the court uh, courts and the different levels of court, the village courts, the tehsil court, the district court, the commissioner's court, and the chief court. Now, how the co uh, cases move from one place to another. Now, if we look at that, we are not only talking about state law and society, we are also talking about how a language becomes part of that society, how it becomes part of the common sense of the people, how, if one is to use the Bordeauxian language of habitus, how does the taken for granted language of the habitus emerge um, with all its qualifications on the category, how does the uh, taken for granted world of law 
uh, how does it emerge now that's again something i'll be focusing on and finally to round this all up now i would argue uh, that this process of conflict that i'm looking at and some of the instances that i'm taking up and the stories that i'll tell now these are processes which don't only show the gap between the code and the law uh, on the practice or the, the theory and the practice uh, what i would argue is that this practice that i'm referring to these conflicts at the lower level at the village or the uh, court level these actually react back on the code to transform the code therefore law if you have to have a larger theory of law or a colonial power it is not a power which may be all governing uh, nor is it i'd suggest is completely constrained but it's it's a power which is constituted through a process of everyday struggles conflicts negotiations and conver conversations with people uh, and the conflicts that uh, are there in the court cases to the villages and through that the specific nature of the code is formulated and reformulated and the nature of colonial law is uh, actually defined over time so this is a process therefore which is not simply about um, sorry And this is not a, a story only about the gap between, as I said earlier, gap between code and the practice. It is also an argument about how the code itself emerges over time. It's never fixed. It's never there once and for all stated and formulated at the beginning of legal history of colonial India. So that's uh, what I, uh, those are my preliminaries. And I'll develop the argument here through a discussion uh, of specific kinds of cases a speci uh, and the evidence will be primarily from North India and uh, uh, primarily from various regions from Pakistan to uh, Punjab. Um, over the colonial years, uh, if we have to look at the history from uh, the 19th to the 20th century, we see a particular kind of an agrarian society emerge. Uh, mm, uh, in India. There are variations, there are patterns, there are regional uh, stories to be told and which have been told. But we see a pattern where there are certain certain broader commonalities and that needs to emphasi be emphasized also. That is, we see a colonial agrarian imaginary wh which uh, uh, in which valorizes, which celebrates settled agrarian society. Um, it's, a, uh, it's an imaginary where progress, development, or the essential basis of a modern, a modern society in the colonial context is the agrarian. Is, and that agrarian is, does not incorporate all groups within agrarian society, but primarily the settled peasant agriculturalist. Um, there is no space and there is no legitimate, authentic uh, space there for the pastoralist or for the, uns and for the mobile cultivators, the shifting cultivators, or the forest dwellers. They are all allowed to exist, but uh, in some way their existence is seen as a burden on society. They really do not have space within that society. It's an imaginary which is, uh, which is rooted on a notion of uh, settled agriculture being the basis of uh, uh, pr uh, uh, mm, proper agra uh, proper um, uh, established agrarian society within the colonial countries. Within this, the the uh, within this agrarian imaginary, the village has an extremely important place, and uh, one uh, one can show uh, one has uh, been able to show a lot of work uh, studies have shown how the village itself comes to be imagined and constituted in the colonial period uh, in specific ways. As an institution, its, uh, uh, its uh, characteristics are defined, its uh, position and power is consolidated, and the patriarchal structure within the villages is uh, consolidates over time. Uh, now, this is um, mm, a notion of the, the notion of village which emerges in much of North India is a notion of village which is premised on a patriarchal brotherhood. A patriarchal brotherhood which is based on 
uh, patrilineal agnetic inheritance. That is, the idea is that each village was originally founded by one person, one male member, who is the original ancestor. These are the myths of origins of the villages. One original ancestor moves from a region which is uh, of settled, densely settled cultivation to another region, establishes a village, and his male descendants begin to inhabit the village, and the village is uh, divided up over time amongst the male descendants of the original in, uh, inhabitant, the original ancestor who actually founds a village. And the relationship between the ancestor and the present inhabitants is extremely important in understanding custom, law, uh, property, marriages, inheritance, everything. So there, and this, these uh, members of the village at any point of time, according to colonial imagination, now we'll see whether this is actually what uh, was there, according to their imagination, this, the, the relationship between the different members of a village community is a relationship therefore of, uh, uh, is a co-parsonary relationship where they all in some way actually can trace their uh, lineage back to the original inhabitant. Uh, and inheritance here is always patrilineal. The female does not inherit because the marriage custom within these villages is a, uh, and there is a form of marriage which is essentially village exogamy. That is, women move out and it is, uh, it is uh, patrilocal marriages, therefore m men continue to live with, the, pair, uh, with the, uh, the male members and the woman moves out to another village and settles with the husband's family. And if the woman is moving out, then you cannot have the woman inheriting because that would lead to the breakup of the village. Uh, land because the, if the if somebody else in another village has a right over your village that is seen within the British imagination that is seen as something which will lead to the collapse of the village community. Therefore, patrilineal uh, male inheritance is the only way in which the village community could be sustained, and this was codified into law. That is, all village communities in North India were to be premised upon on, uh, were premised on the notion that patrilineal male inheritance is the basis of uh, uh, is the essential basis of agrarian society and that should be codified therefore the code announces that uh, females cannot actually inherit women cannot inherit and that has a whole series of um, implication which we'll see it has implications about adoption it has implication about gifts it has implications about wills when they come up as wills it has implications about notions of who is an outsider, who is an insider within the village. It has an implications about how do you define relationship between villages, who is a stranger, who is an alien, who is uh, not an alien. All these get tied up essentially with one central argument, which is the notion of patrilineal male agnetic inheritance. Yet, if we really look at the uh, evidence at the local village level, it's very clear that patrilineal male inheritance was not the norm in within uh, the villages usually before the British rule and continued not to be the norm through the British rule for a very long period. It was actually over a period of time there was a conflict between the existing norms and customs where the, the, the pressure of m uh, uh, this myth of patrilineal inheritance is uh, uh, leads to a, uh, the, this myth leads to a situation that uh, which leads to continuous conflict between what exists and what ought to be. Uh, what is there and what ought to be there and this ought and is uh, the conflict between these two leads to a variety of conflicts um, uh, conflicts within the villages and all sorts of social uh, contradictions within the villages. Here I'll tell, uh, tell you a few stories from the court cases to show what are the kinds of variation, what happens and how are these court cases decided uh, uh, over time. Uh, <coughs> Um, the patrilineal inheritance, the, the, uh, what I'm talking about, this was encoded into law by 1872 and in terms of these codes, in terms of the code of the law in 1872, um, no sons and daughters were allowed, no sons, uh, um, and the, uh, sorry, no daughters were allowed to inherit property, only sons could inherit property. And in the absence of sons, 
property was passed and this is an extremely important rule because this led to a whole uh, uh, a number of land legislations uh, and uh, defined uh, village conflicts over time and often led to violence and murders etc within villages because these codes become very very important in defining social relationship in the absence of sons property was to pass to the nearest male agnate that is uh, in the f uh, I, uh, the uh, it could be up to the seventh degree male agnates had a right over the daughter that was the encoded rule uh, so uh, you had to uh, you know the first cousin the second cousin the third cousin the fourth cousin the fifth cousin you know you can move uh, laterally and males had the right over the daughters <coughs> Uh, in uh, preference to the female descendants. This is 1872. The son-in-law, of course, if the daughter doesn't have right, then the son-in-law, according to those, this code, has no right. Uh, uh, and he has no right in the father, uh, father-in-law's property. And a widow, uh, after the f death of the husband, has only a life interest, as long as she did not marry. Or, as I'll argue later, as long as she remained chaste. Uh, evidence of unchastity is was evidence of uh, was uh, um, the basis of loss of property. But that again, we have to see what did it mean. What was un, uh, cons to be considered as not being chaste <coughs> within this colonial imagination? Therefore, uh, you have a particular notion of a unilateral descent, which defines relationship between men and women, and which then defines relationship between village, one village and another village, and the stranger and the alien. But if we look at the evidence, we find that it is very, uh, it's obvious that even the officials knew that this is not what really exists in practice. Uh, mm, British colonial officials were extremely sensitive, I think, unlike a lot of earlier nationalist notions where law is seen as something just imposed on society. Here we see them going to the villages, inquiring, looking at the law, trying to understand what it is, yet that desire to know is in conflict with certain overarching framing discursive uh, ideas they have within the discourses of the time and it is that discourse which uh, creates a conflict between what they see and what they feel ought to be uh, this um, uh, this process of inquiry as they proceed they find over a period of time that uh, everywhere there is a uh, conflict over property. Uh, everywhere there is uh, the, uh, uh, a series of uh, uh, the, the conflicts over property lead to a questioning of uh, the codes which they had enumerated. Now, let me give one or two examples of uh, the patrilineal inheritance. Now, this is the case of a particular case uh, where uh, Kishan Singh, who lived in a village in Amritsar in Punjab, um, uh, um, this is about his uh, uh, a story of him and his uh, wife and his son uh, uh, and all about their inheritance. He lives in a village in Amritsar. He had no son. His daughter Achra Devi uh, and a son-in-law Mehtab Singh lived with him and looked after his land. When Kishan Singh died around 1853, his widow Roop Kaur took possession of the property, but her daughter, in, uh, daughter and son-in-law continued to reside with her looking after her, managing her land and bringing up their child who was called Jodh Singh. Even after Roop Kaur died, that's the wife dies, uh, Achra Devi, the daughter and the son-in-law continues to live in that place and cultivate the land. But soon in the 1870s we find that they begin to take the rounds of the court. Uh, in 1875 Kishan Singh's nephews filed a suit challenging the daughter's right to inherit. They had lived there for 20 years, but now, suddenly in the 70s, this is challenged. Did Achra Singh and her son Jodh Singh have a right to Kishan Singh's land? Officials and judges could not come up with one single answer. Uh, they were all uncertain. On the basis of an inquiry into the issue, uh, into the, uh, uh, the issue, the assistant commissioner concluded that there was no custom that excluded daughter in preference of male collaterals. Subsequently, from the lower level, as the case moves up to the commissioner, we find that the commissioner then uh, conducts his own inquiry and his two informants, because they again, in, uh, the inquiry was through informants of the time, the, uh, Gunda Singh and Bhagwan Singh, they said that uh, the daughter had no right. The first one had said the daughter had a right, then they said daughter had no right. On Then Achra Singh, the daughter, 
appeals to the higher court and the case goes up to the chief court and here the uh, judges again express, uh, uh, expressed a view which was radically opposed to the lower courts. Uh, Justice Lindsay spoke eloquently against the mythic rights of collaterals. He dismissed the ruling of Gunda Singh and Bhagwan Singh as their personal opinion on what should be the custom rather than what was the custom. Uh, Lindsay claimed to have followed the evidence with care but he had found no proof within quotes, no proof of the alleged custom. They ex uh, which uh, that excluded the daughter. On the contrary, he cited many instances when daughters and daughters and, son and daughters' sons had succeeded to property, uh, to the exclusion of all collaterals, all the agnate agnates that uh, had been given power. Justice Campbell, the second judge of the chief court, however, was not persuaded by this evidence, and he was convinced of the importance of the agnetic principle, and therefore he he decreed that Achra Devi, that is the daughter had no right to the father's land. Therefore, you find that as the court move, uh, case moves up from the lower level to the second level to the third level, the officials and the, uh, the lawyers have a different notion of what was the right and what is not the right. Uh, so, in some way, we find that the judges, the lawyers and the court officials, none of them have a, are certain or have a fixed notion of what the law was or what the custom was and this is something which uh, we find repeated over and over again now actually within the custom in north india within punjab there uh, the son-in-law very often was incorporated within the village through a notion of what was called the ghar jamai that is you become the jamai the, uh, uh, jamai of the the son-in-law of the village not just the household of the village and ritually through social uh, uh, participation in community festivals and uh, uh, collective uh, um, uh, festivals you are actually ritually incorporated within the village and therefore you are no longer an outsider you become an insider and in a sense this makes uh, this is perfectly understandable because if the the son-in-law is really incorporated he actually breaks off his relationship with the outside village and becomes part of this village and therefore there is no real threat to the property the the the, the uh, unity of the property within the village because the right doesn't go to somebody else it remains within the village yet there is this conflict between the agnetic principle and the local principle and therefore continuously these kinds of uh, cases come up whether the daughter has a right or whether the daughter does not have a right whether the son-in-law can come in or whether the son-in-law cannot come in and in each of the cases uh, there are hundreds of cases I've discussed in each of these cases a different rule and a different norm is actually uh, followed um, I'll, uh, this kind of a case uh, uh, of the exogamous uh, marriage community is different from the endogamous marriage community. Uh, in the case of the Muslims, most of the Islamic groups there, marriage was uh, here in uh, was endogamous, uh, and therefore here uh, and uh, the British found it very difficult to reconcile the norms of the community with their. Uh, notion of ag uh, patrilineal inheritance because here the, the woman did not really move out of the village they remained within the village and if you m marry within then that cannot possibly disrupt the unity of the village or the the uh, the the un uh, the 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 uh, destroy the unity of the patrilineal control and hold over the land within the village yet we find in all these court cases that the judges sometimes try and resist uh, uh, accepting, they do not accept that uh, this, uh, the women amongst the Pathans, amongst the Awans, amongst others could actually inherit. But in a lot of cases, they actually uh, concede that uh, women's rights have to be accepted within particular communities and we cannot have a uniform rule for all villages or, and all communities. Uh, I'll skip the evidence because um, um, are, uh, uh, and go on to discuss some of the other issues here. See the, uh, which is a related issue of how patrilineal inheritance is linked up with the other question of adoption of wills and gifts. Now, within if um, um, within a system within a society which accepts patrilineal inheritance 
adoption very often uh, here was seen as a as a way of incorporating the male or the uh, the, the brother in uh, son in law and other males into the community you adopt in order to make them your own and they may not be even related to you but you can make them in your make them your own and uh, when the british inquire into the custom of adoption they find that it is fairly prevalent within punjab as it was in other places but the point is they still wanted to regulate it because who do you allow who can be adopted and who cannot be adopted and there they decreed that you can adopt a sonless uh, proprietor can adopt the son of one of his brothers but not one of his sisters that is a sister's uh, your sister's uh, or your wife's uh, sister's son or your sister's son because it becomes non agnetic male inheritance they could not be adopted yet again we find lots of cases where actually in the court cases this adoption is allowed and as the cases move up from the lower level to the upper level to the higher level uh, the lawyers and uh, the judges are uncertain about whether to allow it or whether not to they never never uh, uh, certain some people allow it other people do, do not allow it and then uh, certain uh, norms are created where personal laws particular laws of a particular community is seen as acceptable as different from the normal universal law of the the province or the state is therefore the distinction between the universal code and the personal code of a community is introduced but again here uh, the cases would be interesting to uh, discuss and just give one uh, case uh, to um, show how this uh, thing happens um around 1860 in village kazi court of tehsil tantaran again in amritsar a peasant proprietor shama adopted his sister's son sant singh when shama died in 1871 sant singh continued to cultivate the 24 gumaos that's a unit of land and three canals that shama owned shama's elder brother filed a suit after some time shama's elder brother filed a suit claiming a right to this land and disputing the adoption the rewazi arm that is the customary code of 1868 had refused to recognize the adoption of the sister son as a valid custom amongst the jats of amritsar when the case comes up to the chief court campbell one of the four judges constituting the bench felt the need for a detailed inquiry the rewazi arm of 1868 that's the code of 1868 did not create according to him uh, the presumption against the rights of the sister son but was the book of custom a true record of the past evidence were such adoptions recognized in earlier times during the 6 the zilla court uh, courts had upheld the custom that is at the lower level arguing that the rewazi arm of 68 could not apply to an act that had happened much earlier and in the past such adoptions were undoubtedly common if indeed past customs were different said campbell it was necessary to know when this custom changed to the non recognition of a sister's son justice lindsay however saw no need for any special inquiry for him the evidence appeared unambiguous inquiries into several cases in the 1860s according to him had unquestionably established that the adoption of sister's son was regarded as valid throughout the province now this goes against the general notion he says it's valid throughout the province yet yet new inquiries were again held because lindsay's argument was not accepted new inquiries are again held and past precedents were looked into and village elders were again re and uh, uh, reinterrogated after a review of the evidence the chief court finally ordered that the adoption of a sister son was not contrary to custom the official book of custom rewazi arm was judicially overruled as an authority into past practice this is the evidence that i'm trying to give that local inquiries local conflicts leads to re renegotiation of the law itself and recodification of the law it's not as if every, uh, at all times the 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 universal code is imposed at a lower level one could uh, argue very uh, one could give more evidence of this sort to show how this again was not the norm that in other cases something else was followed therefore Uh, whether it is the uh, sister's son or the daughter's uh, daughter's son uh, mm, uh, is something which was debated very widely in order to um, uh, maintain the unity of the village patriarchal brotherhood now uh, why was adoption to be allowed 
Now, this is not simply a question of property. Here there was a question, there were other issues of affect and um, uh, emotion involved. Uh, to the British, everything became a question of property and interest. But if you actually see the evidence that is coming up in the court, you see uh, people talking very often in a language which is not that of interest and property, but something else. Uh, I'll just give one or two uh, quotations to show what they are really saying about it. In <coughs> um, um, uh, they were saying, who was one of the Chaudhary's who came, village headman, who came to give evidence on the no naughty question of adoptions, uh, lived in a village uh, in Amritsar, uh, which is 25 kilometers miles away from Amritsar in Kazikot. A, a sonless proprietor, he himself had treated his sister's son, Lena Singh, as his son and gave him his property. Why did he do so, he was asked. Was, was this permissible according to the law of the community? Did the village really permit this? I did this, and I quote him, I did this, said Deva Singh, that he might look after me. I had no son. I made him my son. I gave him Maliki. I had an elder brother, Mangar Singh, who was dead. When I made Lena Singh my heir, but his sons were alive, they were grown up and had children. What objections could they make They make to the way I disposed of my property? I wanted somebody to look after me when I was old. Lena Singh again reaffirmed the expectations of reciprocity implied in the act of adoption here. He says in the court case, Deva Singh first took care of me and now I take care of Deva Singh. Adoption thus carried a certain reciprocal obligation of looking after. I look after you, I adopt you, but you look after me in my old age. And uh, it was not simply a question of uh, looking after me, uh, again a question of interest, but there is in all this a language of love and affection and affect uh, 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 coming up continuously in the debates and discussions. If we look at the question of gift and wills, again they are structured, shaped and uh, uh, constrained by this rule of uh, patrilineal inheritance because gift and wills were again not allowed very often to the sister's son or the daughter's son or to the wife's brother's or son, uh, sister's son. And again there are conflicts which come up and again we find a variety of opinions and uh, gifts and adopt, uh, wills are permitted for a long while but then uh, there is a opinion by the 1870s and 80s that gifts and wills are becoming a mode through which people are actually breaking the norm of patrilineal inheritance deliberately and allowing people from other villages to come in and settle. They would before their own death or uh, on other cases just ask somebody else to come and settle and they would not allow the agnates who had the according to the code the legal right to property they not allow the collaterals to come and claim the property. So this becomes a new battleground between the agnates the collaterals and the proprietors who very often actually wanted their sis uh, sister or the daughter or their sons to inherit property. So there is a battle between the individual will and the collective opinion of the village uh, played out within uh, in, within um, the, th uh, the society at the time. Um, I uh, will skip on to just consider one uh, or two cases of uh, the question of uh, rights to chast chastity because uh, that again I think shows an interesting case of what really happens in the village, how norms are negotiated, how rules uh, are violated, how they are uh, reinterpreted continuously in order to actually negotiate between code and custom. Within the codified custom, and I read here some of the you know, one or two of the instances because I think I'll run out of time after that. Within codified custom, as I said, um, rights of women, widows and daughters, were not generally uh, granted. But uh, um, widows, as I said, had a right, uh, had a life interest. But even that was made dependent on the purity of their bodies. The courts proclaimed that according to custom, an unchaste wid widow lost her rights to her husband's property. In everyday life, however, the meaning of chastity was less clear and the implication was more uncertain than courts could recognize and incorporate within the framework of the code. Who is unchaste? 
what is uh, what is it to be unchaste that was not really something which could be defined within the norms of the village in north india in uh, so easily in late 19th century uh, once again let me tell a few stories uh, to show how this was so uh, so ambiguous and so difficult for uh, people to decide at the time um, <coughs> In 1868, th I'll just give two cases here. In 1868, Mamraj, a zamindar of a village in Delhi, filed a suit for the possession of a piece of land that he had bought from Musammat Sundur. Mamraj complained that Bhola, along with a few other peasants, Bhola an uh, is another peasant of the village, Bhola, along with a few other peasants, had refused to let him, that is Mamraj, let him occupy the land which he had bought from Musammat Sundur. Now, who was Bhola, who was Mamraj, and who was this Sundur? Um, as the case moved up from the court of the assistant commissioner to that of the commissioner, and then to the chief court, it was Musammat Sundur's sexual purity which came up for scrutiny and discussion and debate uh, ev at every level. Mamraj's right came to hinge on Sundur's chastity. Musammat Sundur's husband was Suklal, who died in 1853. Bhola was, di uh, was distantly related to Suklal. He came and cultivated the land that Sundur inherited, that is the widow inherited. What exactly were the terms on which he cultivated the land and what exactly was the relationship of Bhola to Sundur is something the evidence doesn't <coughs> tell us. But we know that Bhola uh, raised the money to get Sundur's, that is uh, Suklal's uh, wife's daughter uh, married. And that's very often seen as an in, uh, evidence that you are in some way the guardian of the place, that you take the responsibility of getting the daughter married. That was an accepted part of the custom. And they often uh, uh, see that as evidence that if you have a right, if you, you have the right, if you have actually got the daughter of the person married. <coughs> um, some years later, however, Sundu begins living with another man, and that was Mamraj, who is actually claiming the land. Uh, uh, Sundu begins living with another man, Mamraj, and he, she bore him a child. And subsequently, around 1866, she sold her land to him for rupees 100. Now, Bhola, who was staying there on that land, was now unwilling to give up the occupancy of the plot that he had in possession for many many years and was contiguous to his land this land was contiguous to the land he uh, possessed and which was in, uh, uh, in the lal kitab that is the village notebook in his in his name and this land was just next to it and he didn't want to give up the name was sundu sale to mamraj valid did she in fact have a right over the land she had sold when Mamraj filed the suit, Bhola's pleader argued that Sundur had forfeited her right because of her unchastity and the rights over the land had passed to her daughter because she was living with Mamraj. And if you are living with another person, you are unchaste and you don't have a right over your husband's property. Uh, and um, the right had therefore passed on to the daughter who is Nutia, a um, girl called Nutia. Now, Nutia then was dragged on from, dragged from the village, asked to come to the court and give evidence. And Nutia said, no, she didn't want to claim any right over the land. So now, then who was to have the right over the land? In terms of codified custom, it was very clear that unchastity led to the loss of a widow's right. But this law, which was seemingly uh, categorical, was still open to diverse readings. What constituted unchastity and what was to be read, read as chastity. A widow could have a relationship with other males. This is, I'm talking of North India and particularly Punjab, but large parts of North India. A widow could have relationship with other males within the husband's household. That was not unchaste. Therefore, it's not a question of morality. It is the husband's, uh, you could have relationship with the husband's brother. That is not considered as unchaste. Uh, cohabitation with the husband's brother was common. And this was not only permissible, but was considered desirable, especially after the death of the husband. Because this allowed the husband family to retain control over the property. If you relate the wife related to um, a man outside, then there will be rights over the property. Here, the control over the body of the woman and the sexuality of the woman became also a control over the property uh, which uh, passed on through the body of the woman, which was attached to the body of the woman. Relationships outside the whole uh, household threatened this control and when the widow moved out of the husband's household to live with another man she entirely repudiated the claim of the husband's household over her and therefore there was a fear of a loss of control 
It is on such occasions when the integrity of the male household property was most threatened that the collective male right over the wife and the household was questioned and the charges of in unchastity were made public. Unchastity became a ground on which conflict over property, over land or women were played out very, uh, in the villages. In the case of Sundur, everyone had accepted in, at all levels of the court, everyone accepted that she lived with Mumraj, Mamraj. She had deserted her husband's household and was therefore unchaste. Could then she exercise any right over inheritance? The court did specify that an unchaste widow lost her rights over the, uh, uh, the husband's property. But what did loss really mean? As pleaders and lawyers debated the concept of loss, specifying the term, turning the meaning around, we see custom in the process of being legally made. It was never codified once and for all. It's continuously being revised and thought about. Rattigan argued, one of the famous lawyers operating in the district court argued, that the court accepted that unchastity prevented a widow from inheriting her husband's property, but it did not imply a loss of right over a property which she had actually inherited before she was chased before she was unchaste. Uh, Sundu's unchastity was publicly affirmed, but since she had actually inherited the property before that, her right to the property also was affirmed. Therefore, you know, there are complicated negotiations going on about who is unchaste, who is chaste, whether you can actually. Therefore, if you become unchaste uh, uh, even before you have really acquired a property, then you do not have the property, but otherwise you have. But this again is not a norm. This is stretching the rule and the uh, a norm. In other cases, this kind of a notion of unchastity really doesn't uh, hold. And uh, you have other kinds of circumstances which are being discussed. So I, uh, and uh, the extremely interesting uh, uh, reflection on what uh, marriage and morality could mean and the, uh, the, mm, the court lawyers are constantly saying that we cannot operate with a universal code of morality. There is no one notion of morality and chastity and marriage and monogamy that we can operate with. These are different societies with different norms. We have to understand the norms of that society and operate on that basis. And if you are operating on that basis, you have to accommodate a lot of the local uh, norms and customs within the court. And finally, do I have five minutes? Yep. Uh, I'll uh, end with uh, uh, one case here to show the thing about uh, the village, um, uh, the notion of the village community, and about the question of what is this village co parsonary brotherhood and what did it mean to threaten this brotherhood. Now, th uh, in the language of the village, uh, in the language of the court, in the, la the discourse of the, the officials, the outsider was a threat to the village. Therefore, uh, agnetic male descent prevented an outsider's control over village property. And this control had to be established and therefore the agnetic male inheritance had to be consolidated and made into law. But who was the outsider? Even that was n people were not very sure. And if you look at the court cases again, we find that the law and the code open up uh, a space for conflict where everything comes under question and everything is all the time negotiated. And I'll give one case of this notion of an outsider to show how complicated the question was and how different norms encoded in the court, um, in the law, actually implied completely different things. Uh, um, uh, the implications of them could be interpreted in completely different ways. Uh, just one case here to make the point. Uh, <coughs> uh, this is from another uh, village um, in Ambala, in, in the Haryana side of Ambala. Um, some years after Musammad Bholi, this is a woman who died in early years of the 20th century when Dasudha Singh suddenly appeared in the village to claim right over the land she had left. Now nobody knew who this Dasuda Singh was uh, and the village proprietors after the death of Musammad Bholi, the woman in the village, then uh, naturally the other proprietors because they saw themselves as co parsonary holders of the land, that is in some way all of them saw themselves as agnetically related to every other village member within the society, they had taken over the land and they saw it as collective property of the village 
and this was seen as common property and used in a variety of ways by the village community. Now suddenly Dasuda Singh comes and says this is my land. Now wh why was it his land? What claim did he have? He said he was a <coughs> nephew of uh, Abel Albel Singh who had originally possessed the land. Now Albel Singh, uh, when Albel Singh died, this land had actually uh, uh, been uh, had passed to Nathu, his son Nathu, and then Nathu's widow Bholi had taken it over after Nathu died. And Bholi, when Bholi died, then that land had been taken over by the village community. And now uh, somebody from a distant village turns up in this village and says, "This this is my land," and a conflict ensues and a court case ensues which goes on for 20 years deciding whether the village community has the land or this nephew who has the land and actually if you look at the case it is extremely interesting as you go up from one level to another you find that two notions of community come into play here one is a notion of the village community as a territorial unity in uh, defined and demarcated by the territorial boundary that is sanctified by the village norms and that was one of the uh, foundational uh, category within uh, the village imaginary of the, uh, the uh, agrarian imaginary of the British. Now this notion of the community comes into conflict with a notion of kinship community which could extend beyond the village. Your eighth degree cousin or nephew could really belong uh, to remain not only in a village nearby could be uh, many miles and kilometers away. Now a whole series of cases we find that this distant cousins begin to come now and begin claiming a uh, right and the village community all consolidate themselves against the outsider. In this particular case actually at different levels um, different decisions again are dis, uh, made so, uh, in s at the first level the village community is granted the right the Sudha Singh's right is denied but at the ultimate final level at the chief court level uh, this Dasuda Singh who says that he is the third degree or fourth degree nephew uh, 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 related in the fourth degree to Albel Singh his right is ultimately affirmed. The point I am trying to say is that there are different implications of the code. The codes are interpreted in different ways, are open to different uh, meanings, uh, you know, ca you can see different meanings and have different implications. But there is always a conflict between what is on the ground and uh, the code as in envisioned by the British at, at the top. And this conflict leads to not only conflict within the villages, they lead to a con continuous re-codification uh, or uh, uh, reworking of the law itself. Uh, so uh, through this I would like to um, uh, argue just uh, two or three points which I made at the beginning that the code is never uh, ultimately uh, fixed. The code wherever it operates is a code is defines a set of norms and rules which is always can be read like any other text can be read in a variety of ways and the norms and rules have an appearance of clarity and fixity but each of them can be interpreted completely differently and th as they are interpreted new inquiries are made new new uh, explorations into village customs are carried out and the code is therefore uh, redefined so for therefore the code which we see very often as fixed the laws which we are fixed are not so fixed, are not so certain. There is a world beyond the code. And at that level we have to see what is going on the ground in the villages and how that impacts on the law itself and redefines the law. What about the, uh, the other question that I had raised about colonial power? It also shows that colonial power is uh, doesn't have uh, cannot shape everything according to its will and according to its imagination in the way it wants. But nor is it so constrained that it, uh, it has no capacity to reshape. What exists is a continuous uh, tension between its will and what is possible, wha what it wants and what, is, uh, what it, it can carry through. So this conflict actually defines the space within which colonial power um, uh, unfolds over time. And finally, if we look at the way law becomes, uh, uh, the, the court cases develop and the village conflicts develop, we can understand how law really becomes part of the local uh, village imaginary or popular imaginary. It is through these negotiations 
at the village level at the court level at the zilla level at the, at the chief lord court level through these negotiations which happen over years and years the law becomes part of the imagination of the people they can actually cite go with their lawyers go with others to encode but they see a space within which conflict and negotiation can take place over property over rights over a variety of things and this space becomes a space which peasants and others begin to uh, operate within and utilize and as they operate they and uh, they become legal subjects at one level but they also become uh, subjects and citizens of uh, not subjects of the of a state where uh, not citizens of the state subjects of a state which begins now in the 19th and 20th century uh, to think of the world in legal ways and social relationships become not just mediated by affect and relation uh, uh, emotion but also by law and uh, market that's done thank you Thanks, Sina. It's open for discussion. Yeah, William. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to go back to that point where you said that uh, the, the British officials uh, were highly cognizant of the complexity of, of the way in which these things played out on the ground. And so I'm wondering if in your research you've seen that uh, from their point of view, decisions going against the sort of canonical formula uh, for customary law would be experienced as a failure of the law. Or whether